You are about to witness history in the making. Señores claustrales, sentaos y cubríos. Ábrese la sesión. El señor secretario general leerá el acta de nombramiento del doctor Honoris Causa por la Universidad Complutense del excelentísimo señor don Rafael Mechulam. Decreto rectoral 4 2006 de 27 de enero disponiendo la concesión del título de doctor Honoris Causa de la Universidad Complutense al excelentísimo señor don Rafael Mechulam. Why did you agree to let me make this documentary about you? Well, unfortunately, I don't know how to say no. And when a friend asks me, I normally will say yes. But in this case, I would also like to probably push ahead and tell people, here we have a group of compounds, an endogenous system of major importance, it is not being used uh, as much as it should be in the clinic. It is of great promise in the clinic. Let's try to push it forward. And maybe this film can push it forward a bit. Hopefully. Hopefully. This is your daily way to work for the last, uh, how many years? 40 years, 45 years. I moved from Rehovo to Jerusalem in 1966, uh, a year before the war. And uh, I've been here ever since. One of the topics that I decided to work on was the chemistry of the plant cannabis sativa. Cannabis had been used for thousands of years, both as a drug as a recreational agent, but surprisingly, uh, the active compound was never isolated in pure form. I decided, together with uh, uh, my colleague Yechiel Gaoni, to go and do research and find out what are the compounds present in cannabis and particularly what is the active compound, active compounds present there. Well, a scientist should try to find topics of importance. And uh, I, I thought that this is a topic of importance. I knew that the police have a lot of uh, cannabis hashish that's being smuggled from the Lebanon, and after all the legal things were completed, they usually burn it. I was at the Weizmann Institute at that time, a very young person. I went to the director of the Weizmann Institute, the administrative director, and asked him, do you know anybody in the police who can supply hashish uh, to us for research? So he called one of his uh, friends, can you supply uh, cannabis to one of our researchers. And I hear from the other side somebody shouting, is he, meaning me, is he reliable? And uh, the administrative director, who actually almost didn't know me, said, yes, of course he's reliable. Let him come over and pick some cashish. I went over, I didn't have a car, took a bus, got five kilos of hashish, went on the bus, and people in the bus after 15, 20 minutes, 
just started asking, what the hell is this smell? Very unusual smell. I mean, I had five kilos of hashish in my bag going around. But I guess you're the only person in the world that took five kilo of hashish from the police and got away with it. Well, uh, probably yes. It turned out that the police were not allowed to give us cannabis. I didn't have the permit from the Ministry of Health, therefore I had broken the law and the uh, police had broken the law and we should go to prison. Well, it doesn't work that way. I went to the Ministry of Health and some of them were colleagues of mine and the others knew what I was doing, so I said, I apologize, I'm sorry, I won't do it again. Next time when I want hashish, I'll go to the ministry. If and when I needed hashish, I went to the Ministry of Health, I filled the form, I drank some coffee with them, they gave me the permit, I went with the permit every time to the police, the police, I drank some more coffee with them, and I got my hashish and went back to the lab. We started working on those five kilos of hashish. We didn't have a safe. It was just in one of the cupboards in the lab. Nobody really was that interested. So we started extracting it. We started using modern methods. Now, this is important. Up till the mid 60s, even before that, in order to find the structure of a compound, one had to do a lot of reactions. Then, and we were one of the first to do that in Israel, we found that by using the proper instruments, one could find the structure of compounds without doing a lot of chemistry. We put the compound on a column. It is absorbed here in the two or three compounds. This is the way we separated originally the compounds from cannabis. But that was many, many, many years ago. We separated about 10 or 12 compounds, and these compounds included the only one active compound. Active, we tested at that time in monkeys. I had a colleague who worked in a nearby institute, and he had a colony of monkeys, and he and his group indeed tested these compounds in monkeys, and surprisingly found that only one compound did anything in these monkeys. It sedated them. They didn't sleep, but they were sedated. On the basis of this particular observation, we decided there is just one active compound. And surprisingly, this is true to this very day. There is only one major active compound, uh, which is named now Delta-9 tetrahydrocannabinol THC. And this compound causes essentially all the hashish type, cannabis type effects that we know so well. And we wanted to see whether, well, whether this compound, which acts on monkeys, acts also on humans. So we did a s small experiment. There's a wonderful story. It was uh, many years ago about the cake, the special cake that Dahlia made. Well, that was uh, the real testing of THC. We had a few of our friends take 10 milligrams of pure THC on a, a piece of cake that my wife prepared, and five took only the cake without the THC, and we compared the effects. None of us had ever used cannabis before. As a matter of fact, very few people had used cannabis uh, at that time uh, in Israel. All those that took the THC were affected, but surprisingly, they were affected differently. Some said, well, we just feel kind of strange in a different world. We want to sit back and enjoy it. Another one said, nothing happens, but he didn't stop talking all the time. A third one said, well, nothing happens, but every 15, 20 seconds, he will burst out laughing. These effects are well known today. People are differently affected. In one case, however, one of the participants got into an anxiety state. She felt, I believe, that her psychological guards, if you wish, were breaking down, and all of a sudden, she, she was open to everybody. So she really got into an anxiety state. In some cases, we definitely see anxiety attacks. 
Most do not. Most just uh, uh, feel kind of a little bit disoriented, maybe a little bit sedated, maybe a little bit open to discussion and socially open to uh, whatever is being discussed. You remember what kind of cake it was? Well, it was a very tasty cake. But if you want any details, I can ask my wife the exact details. Well, I'm married to Dalia. We've married her for a few years, about 60 years now, almost. Can we go back to the time that you met? Uh, we were friends in the army, and then a couple of years later, we got married. As a matter of fact, we got married while I was still in the army. We lived in Tel Aviv, and we, I worked in Rehovot. And then 1966, we moved to Jerusalem, and we've been here ever since. Bokertov. Bokertov. Toda. In this particular apartment ever since. Oh, shalom. Bokertov. Bokertov. What's your name? Severe, severe. I'm lazy, and I forget things, and Dalia is I'm lazy, and I forget things, and Dalia. I feel that Dalia has to be next to me if I want to survive on a trip. But you love going to these uh, meetings. Well, uh, meetings are useful in many ways. Uh, people learn what other people are doing and going to do. What they have done is published, so I don't have to go to meetings to learn what other people are have done in the past. Manuel, nice to see you. Most nice. meetings are just uh, getting people from different aspects of a topic. They talk to each other and maybe something new comes out. If you really look at the history and what's been going on ever since he discovered THC, it's not just discovered THC and then just, you know, relied on that and didn't do much, but he continued to have such a vision for the next step, and the next step, and the next step. Nine, eight. Is that a test for whether I'm yes. intoxicated or not? Yes. <laughs> My name is Mahmoud A. El Soli. I am a research professor at the University of Mississippi. Cannabis is what I'm known for. Cannabis is a very old plant, a very old medicine, if you will, that people have used it for so many indications over the years. In the literature, marijuana has been used for all different types of things. Uh, one would say, well, you know, this is crazy. There's no such plant that can, you know, do all of this. And, and today, it's very easy to really go back to this old literature about the different indications for which marijuana was prescribed and find out that uh, there is justification for that. Cannabis was used in the Middle East for thousands of years. As medicine. Who knows, maybe for other things as well. Many of the tribes at the time used cannabis. Assyrians used it for medicine, used it for excitation, as used it in religion. The Egyptians used it as medicine. Surprisingly, the Greeks and the Romans didn't know about the uh, psychoactivity, but they used the uh, cannabis as an uh, uh, anti-inflammatory drug. Cannabis in India was used by people who want to be delivered from all worries and care. Well, that's quite a good definition of anti-anxiety. We knew that cannabis had been used for epilepsy. In the past? In the past. There is, for example, a translation of Arab story of the 15th century, and it says that one of the Arab leaders had epilepsy. Physician came over and gave him cannabis, and it cured him, but he had to take it for his entire life. So the field kind of told us, try it on epilepsy. We first tried it in animals, and it worked. So at this point, we decided to go into humans. Trial took place in Sao Paulo. They had about 10 people that had epilepsy, that could not be affected by the known drugs. We started giving them high doses of cannabidiol, 200 milligrams per day. And you were producing the cannabidiol from hashish? For almost 40 years, we didn't produce it. We isolated it, we separated it from hashish. Hashish contains about 4%, 5% cannabidiol. So it is really quite difficult to isolate, to obtain uh, 
large amounts, but we did that. We were happy to note that indeed they had no seizures while they were taking cannabidiol. And it was published and nothing happened afterwards. So far, 34 years later, this is the only publication of cannabidiol in humans against epilepsy. When one starts research, one never knows how it ends. You know how you start. I was born in Bulgaria and I was a child during the war. Though I was very well aware of what's going on. My father, before the war, he was a physician and he was head of the Jewish hospital in Sofia in addition to his private practice. When the anti-Jewish laws were put into effect, and there were very severe anti-Jewish laws, he decided that maybe, just maybe, going to uh, one of the small villages which badly needed doctors, he and his family, will be in a safer place than staying in Sofia, where the laws were obvious all the time. He was appointed as a village doctor in 1942, I believe it was. And for about two, three years, we spent moving from village to village. And he was the village doctor in many of these places. And I didn't feel so bad at that time. In the village, the doctor was considered uh, an important person. And uh, so we were treated very well. And there was no anti-Semitism. And uh, uh, we had no major problems. But at some point, somebody decided that my father should be taken to a concentration camp and he was taken to a concentration camp and the concentration camp burnt and my father was the only doctor on the spot not that he could do much because he had no drugs nothing to help them but he helped them to a certain extent then he was shortly thereafter released luckily the bulgarian jews were not killed the conditions were bad enough but bulgarian jews were not killed my uncle saved them. How? There was a... In the Ministry of Interior in Bulgaria, they were planning to send all the Jews to, to Poland, to the extermination camps. So the leaders of the Jewish community said, look, we have to know in advance what they're planning. My uncle was a young man, very representative, really everybody loved him. He said, you find one of the secretaries and become her lover and she'll tell you everything. And that's what happened. So I have to write that sometime with a greater yes. detail. So he knew, the community leaders knew exactly what was being planned several weeks in advance or even a month in advance. So they then tried to prevent it by talking to people in the parliament and so on. And the people in the parliament said, that's against the constitution and so on. How the hell did you know that they're going to do it? Oh, we just heard about it. After the war in 1948, 1949, most Bulgarian Jews came to uh, Israel. We came 1949. I worked for a limited period of time as a land surveyor and Later, I went into the army, spent a couple of years in the army doing research, as a matter of fact, research on insecticides. And I uh, took my PhD degree on a topic, natural products related to biological problems. I did the same when I went to the Rockefeller Institute. When I came back and I got a position at the Weizmann Institute, I was looking for problems that are in that field, namely, chemistry problems related to biological problems. But why cannabis? You see, doing research in a small country with a very limited budget, my philosophy was that one should try to find out topics that are not being pursued by the major groups throughout the world. We cannot compete with them. It's obvious that we should try to find by studying the literature, by thinking about important projects, we should follow research pathways that were not being followed 
by major groups. Nobody was working on cannabinoid chemistry. So we thought at that time that this is a project worth following. In 1986, in the introduction to cannabinoids as therapeutic agents, after summarizing the knowledge about the historical use of cannabis, you leave us with a question. Are we missing something? What is that thing? We knew a lot about the plant cannabinoids. They had been evaluated in, in the test tube. They had been evaluated uh, in animals to a certain extent in human patients. But nothing was known at that time about uh, the mechanism. A group in the US, Professor Alan Howlett, she was a young researcher at that time in St. Louis. I really didn't know very much at all about marijuana or cannabinoids. That wasn't my area of expertise. Uh, in the United States, we need DEA approval to get cannabinoid drugs for research, so I got through the approval. I got some Delta 9 THC and did these studies and found some very interesting things. Dr. Howlett found in the brain a specific receptor for THC. It was named the CB1 receptor, cannabinoid receptor number one. Now that was a major, major discovery in the mid 80s. So here we had, for the first time, an indication that THC acts on a receptor. So that was the first momentous discovery. And then once it was discovered that there are receptors, then the next obvious question is, why are there receptors in the human brain for a smoke substance? How did God know that his creations will smoke marijuana? Receptors are made for compounds that we produce, not because there is a plant out there. And the answer, obviously, was that it's not for marijuana. There are some compounds in the body itself which mimic marijuana. So we went ahead looking for endogenous compound. In my lab, there were three collaborators who contributed a lot in this research. My name exactly is Lumir Andrzej Hanusz. I went for socialism. In Czechoslovakia, Professor Meshulam invited me. I'm here already 30, 23 years. 23? I can just for one year and uh, it's a little bit extended. One year, it was not enough for research. He already had here postdoc uh, Bill Devane, Dr. Bill Devane. In the States, I go by Bill. In Ireland, I go by Will. Okay, run over. He used to come late in the afternoon and then work throughout the night. And Aviva Breuer, she worked with me in the lab for about 30 years. She still works with me in the lab. She used to come early in the morning. So sometimes they would meet here. If it was five o'clock in the morning, she would come in and he was just about to leave. In three and a half years, we never had a lab meeting. Looking for the endogenous cannabinoid, a lot of brains were involved. Not only brains of the researchers. Well, we initially worked on brains of pigs. It is generally accepted that the organs of pigs and the organs of humans are somewhat closely related. And probably pigs and humans are also somehow closely related. Well, I'm not sure that the pigs will be very happy to be related to humans, but that's something else. So we wanted to work on pig brains. And the pig brains are not so easy to get in Jerusalem. It's not kosher. I took my car, Bill and I went to Tel Aviv, bought a few kilos of pig brain. The butcher thought that we are having a party. We are going to do something with it, cook the brain. Each time when we came to buy it again, so price was higher. <laughs> At the end, it was very expensive. I got the brain and just made some fractions and put it over a silica a sand column and separate a few fractions and tested them for how they bound to the receptor. And I thought, oh, it won't take long, you know? I can just for one year. But after one year, we, with, with Bill, still we didn't have pure compound. So we asked Professor Meshulam to extend. 
Shalom. A few other labs were already looking for compounds. He thought we might be scooped by some other lab. But we told him, just try it with us. We are very close. And after about two years, we found in extremely low amounts. It was only like a few droplets in the end of a little test tube. A compound in the brain which acts on these receptors. And of course, as with every important discovery, no single lab usually has all the expertise. So Rafi was such a well-known figure in the field that he was able to put together a team of outstanding colleagues, uh, including Roger Pertwee. I'm professor of neuropharmacology at the University of Aberdeen. Considered one of the top experts in cannabinoid receptor research. But they then needed to uh, see whether it uh, behaved like uh, we expect a cannabinoid to behave. So uh, we just developed a new assay for doing that. So they um, sent me some anandamide and we were able to show in our laboratory that it did behave like we would expect a cannabinoid receptor agonist to behave. We've had other collaborations uh, since then, but that was the most, very much the most exciting one. We hadn't uh, figured out the name of it yet, though. The chemical name is arachidonoyl ethanolamine. We could have left it to that. We thought that maybe it has to do with mood, uh, emotions, uh, things of that sort, and therefore we thought, well, if it causes some kind of changes in emotion, maybe it causes happiness. If you smoke marijuana, it gives you a certain bliss. So the natural compound also is responsible for that same type of a bliss, an internal bliss that you have, you know? We looked for a good name, and although some people do not agree with me, but in Hebrew there are not too many names for happiness. For sorrow, you can find a lot of names. But for happiness, not for an extreme happiness. We've looked into Assyrian things, but Assyrian things are more complicated. They call cannabis, with apparently a lot of THC, they call it ganzigunu. Well, call the compound ganzigunu was too complicated. So we decided we'll go to something else. I remember actually uh, discussing the naming of this. Um, I think it was Bill Devane who came up with the name. Is that right? Right. Rafi Msulam and Roger Pertwee and myself were all sitting outside in the sun overlooking a nice little river and two years before I said to Rafi if I isolate this chemical I get to name it don't I? Bill was interested in uh, these Sanskrit stories and he found that Aranda is bliss delight. People who know me know that I study Eastern philosophy and I know lots of Sanskrit words you know Ananda means, in Sanskrit, supreme joy. Professor Meshulam said, you know, it can be a good, it will be a part just on chemical nature of this compound, and because it's ethanol amide. So we did ananda and amide, so it's anandamide. Even in the print form of a dictionary, the Collins Unabridged English Dictionary, and I bought one for my sister and gave it to her, and it's in the dictionary. Anandamide. Anandamide. Yeah. They made this discovery and published in this landmark paper, and its importance is illustrated very well by the fact that it's one of the very few papers in the biomedical literature that has been cited over 2,000 times since its publication. They even don't cite it anymore because it's considered such a well-known thing, an obvious thing that they don't even cite our work anymore. They mention anandamide does A and B and C. It turned out that there is a whole system in the body which uh, is involved around anandamide. And this, in many respects, parallels important systems that the body relies upon them. And this system is called now the endocannabinoid system. And a huge number of researchers are involved in investigating this system from many aspects. I'm a full professor of biochemistry. The basis of my work was to understand how the nervous system works. I, I usually go by Dr. Mary Abu. The CB2 receptor is... Yep. We're trying to discover how the world works, or in our case, how cannabinoids work and how the brain works. 
are there additional uh, receptors that we know CB1, CB2 are receptors? Can you see a difference between the oral administration versus the smoked form, which is a very this small model, we found that activation of CB2 was effective. The compound, uh, which we haven't managed to isolate yet, but we strongly believe exists. The endocannabinoid system is complex, it's very challenging. If the animal during the timeout period is still pressing the, the, the lever, is because he has lost the control. It's just perhaps not easy to describe, actually, how... You know the beginning? No. The, it, it says, Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita mi ritrovai per una selva oscura che la dritta via era smarrita. How all of a sudden the poet found himself in a strange place, a black forest, Selva Oscura is a black forest, and uh, he was uh, lost. But thanks to another poet, that is Virgilio, a famous Roman poet, he found a guide through the hell to the paradise then. לפני הרבה שנים עשיתי דווקא דברים טובים, הייתי מצלם מקרוב מאוד דברים, והם נראו מאוד מעניינים ויפים, אבל זה מה ש... אי אפשר לחזות הכל. אז זה מה שנשאר. Well, many years ago I had the time to play around with photography, but that was many years ago, unfortunately. I don't have time for hobbies. Oh, אנחנו צריכים להתחיל לזוז. As scientists, indeed as intellectuals, we should try always to be skeptical. So in 1995, you had an idea of testing THC on children. It has been known for many years that cannabis can lower the effects of um, anti-cancer drugs. Anti-cancer drugs, many of them, cause terrible side effects. And in children, unfortunately children get cancer as well, children vomit and uh, want to vomit, have nausea, they're really in a bad shape. And they cry all the time, and their parents are in a bad shape. Luckily, most of the children can be cured of the cancer, but the treatment is absolutely difficult. We wanted to do a clinical trial in children. We did that with Professor Avramov, Aya Avramov. She was head of the Department of uh, Pediatric Oncology in one of the Jerusalem hospitals. And we did a major study with uh, THC given in oily drops under the tongue of children. Obviously, children cannot smoke. We had children that were not even one year old. We dropped, or she dropped, THC in oil in olive oil under the tongue at two or three times a day, small doses, during the anti-cancer treatment. At the beginning, we wanted to do a double-blind study. Some of the children got the THC, some other children got only the olive oil. After a week, she told me I'm not going ahead with that. I know exactly who is getting the THC. I know exactly who is not getting it. There was a complete separation. Those that didn't get it continued to vomit. So she went ahead doing an open study and she gave THC, pure THC, under the tongue about 400 times, which means that uh, those that were involved in the experiment got it every time they were treated with whatever they were being treated. And at the end we saw that we had complete, complete block of vomiting, complete block of nausea by small amount of THC, which did not cause any uh, psychoactivity, nothing. So here we had a complete therapeutic effect and we published that. And again, essentially nothing happened. Finito, that was it. It's still not being used in children. And you think it's, it's a good idea? to use it for well, children. Well, I believe it's an excellent idea because we help those children that suffer. But uh, I have no influence on oncologists.
if there is a cancer patient who's got pain and that pain is not being controlled well by other kinds of drugs, they're on cancer chemotherapy, they're vomiting, I think it's unethical to withhold a drug from them that can be very useful to help them in their pain management and in their ability to cope with their disease. In about 1999, he came up with a concept with Dr. Ben Shabbat of the entourage effect, the idea that there were many compounds, uh, endogenous cannabinoids, some seemingly inactive on their own, but together they make this beautiful music. They create uh, an entourage effect that greatly increases activity. Rafi uh, basically spoke to me about this entourage idea and he made a very nice comparison, you know, like politicians, if they go alone to places, nobody pays them any importance. If they go accompanied by perhaps less active uh, components, just the fact that the, the politician or the minister or the president is accompanied by many people uh, makes it more important. So this is the entourage effect. I feel that the same applies to the components of the cannabis plant itself. Uh, and so many of these are what are called minor cannabinoids, uh, contribute to an overall effect that you cannot produce with a single molecule. Uh, this has been a key concept in what the work I've tried to do under his influence. Um, I was convinced that one should only test pure compounds uh, with uh, one target, whereas it's the combination sometimes of the compounds that can do the trick. A very serious group of uh, researchers has recently published a paper saying that the endocannabinoid system is involved in essentially all human diseases. If you combine CB1 receptors and CB2 receptors, they cover most of the organism, at least in mammals. We are mammals. We are mammals. Okay. But uh, when you talk of mammals, you talk of uh, horses and dogs and mice and rats and rabbits and lions and... We all share the endocannabinoid system. I believe so. I believe so. And it has been demonstrated in many species. Because now suddenly everyone has cannabis in their bodies, or everyone has a cannabinoid in their bodies, so it can't be bad. These molecules that we all have are so critical from the birth to the death of each of us in health and disease. He suggested that endocannabinoids in the milk of, of mothers actually may contribute to the hedonic effects of, uh, uh, of, of the milk. And it turned out to be uh, almost true actually. So he, had, he has a great vision. And then I know that he suggested to Itai Bab that he should look at the bone. Why would anybody in the world actually, with all preconception, look at bone development? We're going to my lab. We can go through the bigger entrance. Oh, to the small... Through the small entrance here. My name is Professor Itai Bab. I'm the director of the Bond Laboratory at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. We're going to see now the cannabinoids in bones? Yes. Okay. Ah, so you do have a laboratory here. You've been here. You... We have discovered the skeletal endocannabinoid system. These are osteoclast cultures. Osteo osteoclast. 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 Osteoclast are cells that break down bone. Okay. So she is analyzing the effect of uh, cannabinoids on the number of osteoclasts. This is the growth engine, which is similar in mice and humans. Mm -hmm. You see here the brown cells, these are CB1. Receptors, these are serious receptors in the engine. We've got a lot of research now going on because now we know there are CB1 and CB2 receptors in those kinds of cells that either help degrade the bone or help rebuild the bone. 
In this day and age, people are living, women beyond menopause, men well into old age, and we're going to have to think about how to preserve those bones so they can last another 40 years after menopause. When a woman becomes pregnant, basically the body should get rid of the embryo because the embryo, to a certain extent, 50%, comes from a different organism from the father. The body doesn't do that. We don't know why the body doesn't do that. It's kind of a lowering of the immune system, certainly around the embryo. And it seems, it's quite possible, that the endocannabinoid system, in a white sense of meaning, may be involved in prevention of uh, this kind of immune effect, which is the basis of our life. I mean, obviously, if uh, the embryo is kicked out, there's going to be no life on this uh, planet. And then, sir, right. I need you to fill in all this here, okay, according to your whimsy. Yes. You want to go? And uh, where are you from, sir? Israel. Israel, oh, well, that's very cool. That's cool. You know why? Why? Because the first guy to discover tetrahydrocannabinol is actually an Israeli man. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hello. You are named as the grandfather of cannabis research or cannabis Well, I'm a grandfather of seven grandchildren, and uh, I'm very happy with them. So you're not accepting the title, the grandfather of cannabis research? We started research when essentially nobody was doing research. So if this is the grandfather, okay, so I'm a grandfather. el claustro de la Universidad Complutense, a propuesta de la Facultad de Medicina y en testimonio del reconocimiento de vuestros relevantes méritos científicos, habéis sido nombrado doctor honoris causa. En virtud de la autoridad que me está conferida, os entrego dicho título. Works on the ego. Obviously, people are happy to get an award, uh, that people recognize their work. Definitely, I mean, it would be silly to say that I don't care. Yes, definitely I care, like anybody else. Os impongo como símbolo el birrete laureado, antiquísimo y venerado distintivo del magisterio, llevado sobre vuestra cabeza como la corona de vuestros estudios y merecimientos. I've received quite a few awards in different places in the world. Recibid el libro de la ciencia que os cumple enseñar, difundir y adelantar, y que sea para vos significación y aviso de que por grande que sea vuestro, que vuestro ingenio fuere, debéis rendir acatamiento y veneración a la doctrina de vuestros maestros y predecesores. In Israel, I got the Israel Prize, the Rothschild Prize, other prizes, got the important prizes in Germany, in the US, had awards in the Czech state. Recibid el anillo que la antigüedad entregaba en esta venerada ceremonia, como emblema del privilegio de firmar y de sellar los dictámenes, consultas y censuras de vuestra ciencia y profesión así como los guantes blancos, símbolo de la pureza que deben conservar vuestras manos, uno y otros signos también de la distinción de vuestra categoría. Had, uh, one in Spain, one in the US, one in Israel. 
porque os habéis incorporado a esta universidad, recibid ahora, en nombre de su claustro, el abrazo de fraternidad de los que se honran y congratulan de ser vuestros hermanos y compañeros. The National Institute of Health gave me an award recently. In 1962, I had asked for a grant from NIH, but NIH wrote me back, well, the topic you're interested in, namely the constituents of cannabis sativa, is not a relevant topic for the US. It's not used in the US. When you have something more relevant, ask us for a grant. So a year later, I got a phone call from one of the main pharmacologists of the National Institute of Mental Health, said he's interested in cannabis. So all of a sudden they had a change of mind. So I asked them, what happened? Well, apparently somebody high up, an important person, maybe a senator, had called NIH and asked, uh, what does cannabis do? It seems that his son had been caught smoking pot. What? Yes, yes, it's the truth, father. And I'm pretty, Pretty ashamed of it. And he wanted to know whether the marijuana destroys his mind. Now, they didn't know anything about marijuana, and the only thing that they actually knew was that a young person from the Middle East had asked for a grant and was working on it. So, a pharmacologist came over and asked me, are you still working? And said, yes, we had just identified the active compound, and we had a large amount of the active stuff there. We had about 10 grams of THC, So he said, please give us the 10 grams and we'll do a lot of pharmacology in the US. So he got the world supply of THC, nobody had THC at that time, got the world supply of THC, took it to the US. Actually, he probably smuggled it because I don't think that he had a license so uh, he could take it to the US. But then of course, nobody was looking for THC, it was not a known compound. So he took it to NIH And for the next couple of years, most of the research in the U.S. on THC was done with material supplied by us, those grams that uh, they took. And for many years, nearly 40, 45 years, I was supported financially by the National Institute of Health. And they never, never interfered with my research. the cannabinoid field was starting to really come online and there was this big connection with endogenous cannabinoids and exogenous cannabinoids and pain. My PhD was in female reproductive pain. It's just really fun to be at this point of going, wow, we're actually you know, understanding some of the mechanism of why women basically have taken cannabis for thousands of years for reproductive pain. I would consider myself still as a mouse geneticist and neurobiologist. So our approach is to make uh, mutant animals. So almost every talk that you hear contains some data that were generated with the mice that, that we generated, that we made. You get seniority if death you can't avoid. The lab was up to me. I chose cannabinoids, heard it's a fun house where a little lab mouse can party. For several years, I was um, researching uh, motor neuron disease, uh, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and was able to show that uh, THC was actually uh, protective for in the mouse model of ALS, uh, the mice that were given THC uh, lived a little longer and did a little better than the ones that uh, did not get treated with, with THC. So that was really exciting work. Pass that new compound over to me, doc. Then I swim around, you can punch the clock. Work on mice has been done in so many areas that I normally joke, saying that if I were a mouse, I can be treated for just about every disease around. Well, it is partly true. I ain't cynical, life's a clinical trial for a mouse or a man. Anandamide and 2-AG, although they were discovered uh, almost 20 years ago, 15, 20 years ago, they have never, never been administered to a human. So we speak about mice. Well, mice are mm, uh, 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 
nice animals, but they are not definitely not humans. Let me nibble your cannabigibaro. Just let me nibble, nibble your cannabigibaro. Obviously. Mice can be treated with cannabinoids for cancer, mice can be treated for all kinds of other diseases, which in humans, the answer is no, it has not been tested. Um, can cannabis cure cancer? Well, first of all, we know that THC lowers the effects of cancer treatment. But what you're asking is, is it an anti-cancer drug? And the answer is, I don't know. And the reason for that is silly. It has been tested in the test tube. THC has been tested, cannabidiol, crude can cannabis has been tested in the test tube. And yes, in many cases, it uh, blocks the development of cancer cells. Yes. Professor Guzman is a major researcher in Spain. He has worked on the mechanisms through which cannabinoids act on cancer. In our hands, classical cannabinoids are the ones that work best by large in inducing cell death in cancer cells. THC comes from cannabis from, or comes from, from no, no, yeah, synthetic? We, no, it, it's, it can, it, THC coming from cannabis. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's THC, the real THC. Now we know that cannabinoids can exert anti-tumor actions in animals, not only in brain tumors, but in many different types of tumors. We know that cannabinoids act not only by inducing cell death through that specific mechanism called apoptosis, but we know that cannabinoids can tackle other processes of cancer cell growth, such as angiogenesis, metastasis, cell cycle, etc. He even did a small clinical trial. We did a trial with nine volunteers that had a very malignant form of brain cancer, glioblastoma multiforme, and we observed some positive effects of cannabinoids in survival of the patients and also on tumor growth, both on imaging techniques, magnetic resonance imaging, and also based on the measurement of some biomarkers of tumor progression. Though we have done quite a lot in the field of cannabinoids and endocannabinoids, we have not done enough in clinical trials. This is something that has to be done. If this is not done, we will certainly miss a lot and we will not be helping human patients. It should be done. I have one dream that comes on and off in very different ways. I'm in a city that I don't know and I don't know how to go back to the hotel I'm staying and I don't remember the name of the hotel, and I get into an anxiety and I wake up. And this has happened many, many times. So I think it has to do with um, whatever happened in the Second World War when my parents uh, told me, remember these names and these addresses, because if, you are, if we disappear, you should go there. Which is, uh, uh, well, not very, pleasant, which is quite a shock, probably to a child. And of course, we were very afraid that we'll be separated, uh, my parents and I, uh, I was afraid. I now remember more than I did over the many, many years that have passed since then. All the people, they start remembering things that happened in their childhood. At one point, somebody decided that it is worthwhile testing cannabis with relatively high doses of THC, I believe, in people that are Alzheimer or Alzheimer-like patients. They got it in their food, in the yogurt or whatever. Some of them, I believe, not all of them, but some of them were in a better shape. Some of them started speaking, their eyes became brighter. In one case, 
a next writer started writing again. In another case, a woman said, I feel fine and went home. So it seems to be helping the symptoms of Alzheimer or senility. <laughs> Alzheimer at the moment uh, is a huge, huge problem and there is very little that can be done uh, for Alzheimer patients. So maybe if it is well researched in the future, we should know how to help these patients. We are dealing here with population of millions and this population will grow because in most countries, Western countries at least, the number of older people is growing all the time. We are lucky that cannabis is not toxic. People do not die from overdose of cannabis. Most appropriately for a cannabinoid meeting, uh, we're ending on a high, really, in the form of a talk by Rafi Mishulam, uh, who's, of course, the father of uh, modern cannabinoid research, no doubt about that. And now I would like to end with uh, something that's really crazy speculation. Each one of us has a different personality, and we have no idea why. Why do we have different personalities? Well, part of it is the effect of the environment, okay? But part of it is genetic, and we don't know why we have different personalities. One way of explaining it is there are several hundred compounds, endocannabinoid-like compounds. They are like anandamide in their chemical structure that are present in the brain, and it is quite possible that each one of us has a different, slightly different level of these compounds. This is genetic. This is based on the different DNA of everybody, but DNA doesn't affect the personality. It is the compounds that are formed from DNA through RNA to proteins and peptides and, and secondary compounds. So it is quite possible that differences in the endocannabinoid system, endocannabinoid-like system, can have something to do with the different personalities. Well, that's a very complicated story, but it may work. I went to a mathematician and told him, look, I believe that there are eight billion people on this planet, and I believe that there are eight billion different personalities. Is it possible that the 200 compounds that we have may be involved? He said, of course, there are so many possibilities that the ratios of 10 of these to 10 of others and so on will cause that. This is a crazy speculation, but at some point we'll have to find a biochemical basis of why we are different. Many years ago, when I had an administrative position in my university, I was rector, I was told never give an after-dinner speech before the dinner. And I sincerely apologize for doing so now. He used to get the hat from the police. And we used to chop it up in the lab. It's 555 nanometers, and it's the healthiest for, for your eyes. This is from cannabis. If you are in the nature green, uh -huh. it's the healthiest. Yes. It's 555 nanometers. Popular media is very powerful and very convincing. We should try to go to the basis of these media presentations and be convinced that the facts support the conclusions. This is true for every sphere of life and certainly for every scientific area. And I want to thank many of my collaborators. We have drank uh, coffee many, many times. I believe that the next paper will be um, uh, drinking coffee uh, as a scientific method, and we... So if Viagra can get the Nobel...